platform to speak to speak about the media bias uh, in the coverage of this war on Gaza. Uh, as we know, it's a fact that truth is often the very first casualty of war. But the lies, the deception, the misinformation and disinformation witnessed in the coverage of the war on Gaza by some media, the bias and racism is unprecedented, I would say. Also, the persistent dehumanization of Palestinians, as if their lives mattered less or didn't matter at all. The censorship of pro-Palestinian voices has also been clear during this war. The irony is that the censorship is being practiced by those same news networks and outlets that many of us uh, had long believed to be balanced and objective, and which were previously thought to be advocates of free speech and freedom of expression. When the October 7th attacks happened, they were covered by, they were covered extensively by all media outlets. But Israel's disproportionate response was downplayed by a lot of media. So six weeks into the war, and with a death toll of more than 15,000 Palestinians, half of them children, some Western journalists are still asking guests on their show, the analysts and the political commentators, whether they condemned Hamas. Never mind that schools, hospitals, UN facilities had been bombed, more than 50 journalists killed, medics targeted, doctors without borders, UN staffers. Many of us following the news were utterly dismayed by the one voice narrative, appalled even at how some Western media acted as a mouthpiece for the Israeli government and the Israeli military. They were simply parroting their propaganda without questioning what they were being fed. And in turn, they were feeding it to the public. They used one language for Israelis and another for Palestinians. Let me cite some examples. Terms like brutal murder, like atrocities or massacres were used only to describe the deaths of Israelis, but not Palestinians. One headline used uh, the word dead for civilians killed in Gaza and killed for Israelis that were killed in the Hamas attacks. Now, how did those civilians in Gaza die? It wasn't in a natural disaster. The Israeli claims of beheaded babies were still making headlines without any concrete evidence to support such claims. And this despite denials from some Israeli officials. On the other hand, the story about the IDF indiscriminately shooting at people on October 7th, including at their own people, the Israelis, uh, some were killed by friendly fire, that didn't make headlines in the Western media. Another example is the hospital attack. One headline read, strike on Gaza hospital kills hundreds Palestinian officials say. Attack by who? This was perhaps deliberate to make readers question that it had happened at all. After all, there were numerous reports questioning the death toll given by the Palestinian Health Ministry and saying that the numbers were inflated, even though United Nations experts clearly said that the actual number was likely much higher because of people still buried under the rubble. Now, just compare that with the coverage of Russia's war on Ukraine by the very same news organizations. 
War crimes are war crimes, no matter who commits them. How can the targeting of schools and hospitals be a war crime when committed by Russia, but not when committed by the IDF? Many Western journalists, and I'm not saying all, but many, turned a blind eye to what literally was staring them in the face. There was a consistent pattern to see no evil, hear no evil, not just by some racist officials, but also by the media. We witnessed even more bias in favor of Israel with the solidarity marches in Western capitals and around the world, with some media referring to them as pro-Hamas or hate marches rather than pro-Palestinian demonstrations. Why is an entire population being equated to Hamas when half that population wasn't even born when Hamas was elected in government? Let's not forget that Hamas is designated a terrorist organization in the West. So those news reports were in actual fact demonizing, vilifying the protesters, inciting against those marching for justice for the Palestinians for call, or calling for a ceasefire to avert more civilian deaths. Is that not a legitimate right in countries where there's freedom of speech, freedom of assembly and freedom of expression? The media narrative, uh, the media narrative uh, excusing Israel persisted, even though readers, listeners, viewers, the audience could very well see for themselves the horrifying facts unfolding in real time. The facts are that Palestinians, an entire population, is being displaced. Schools and hospitals are under attack. One in five Palestinian children were killed on a daily basis in the last six weeks. And yet no journalist or UN representative could utter the words ethnic cleansing or genocide. Even though genocide experts have concurred, Israel was indeed carrying out a genocide. One prominent Jewish commentator who appeared on one of the talk shows described the conditions in Gaza before the October 7th attack as a concentration camp. He had a title on the screen self-hating Jew under his name. Isn't Gaza indeed an open air prison with collective punishment being inflicted on the population there? We as journalists are trained to be balanced and objective and to put away, to put aside our biases when reporting. At least that's what I've been taught throughout my career. And I was trained by seasoned Western journalists and media professionals. Now, seeing some of those same veteran journalists resort to self-censorship to avoid a backlash was very disappointing, to say the least. When the former Israeli intelligence chief appeared on CNN and said, there are no civilians in Gaza, that the entire population was Hamas. The presenter didn't even challenge him. Some journalists think it's okay. The audience will believe the lies that they're being fed. Yes, some may indeed, but those are the people already conditioned to hate Arabs and see them all as terrorists. As for the rest, well, too bad, there's social media. What the mainstream media tried to hide was exposed on social media platforms. A word of caution though, platforms like X and others are also being used to spread misinformation and propaganda. So it's vital that internet users remain vigilant 
and question everything they read or hear. Here, I must mention the attempts to impose censorship on X, formerly Twitter. There's growing pressure on major companies to stop advertising on Twitter after the platform's owner endorsed an anti-Semitic tweet. This led major American companies like Apple, IBM, Paramount and Disney to suspend their advertising campaigns on X. You lose money, you lose your job, you stand to lose your income, perhaps even your life, if you as much as like the wrong tweet. One commentator lamented via his account on X that a well-respected network that was interviewing him closed the interview by contradicting him when he said Gaza was an occupied territory. Isn't Gaza an occupied territory? I mean, that's what the United Nations has designated Gaza. I mean, that was enough for the interviewer to mute him and cut him off. I've had the same experience several times. Media channels that celebrated my resignation from Nile TV during the 2011 uprising when I left to protest censorship have censored my interviews, taking them out of context or taking out the words ethnic cleansing. Now with 20,000 civilians dead in six weeks, isn't that genocide? What do we call the displacement of an entire population? Haaretz, which did some fairly balanced reporting during the war, now faces accusations by Israel's communications minister of subverting Israel in wartime, undermining the morale of soldiers and serving as a mouthpiece for incitement of Israel's enemies. Propaganda in the service of the enemy, presenting the enemy's narrative, presenting lies, using anti-Zionist and anti-Israeli terminology, and justifying enemy claims. Haaretz is one Israeli news site that has been rather objective throughout the war. It has called for the release of the hostages. It has also called for an end to extrajudicial killings by settlers of Palestinians in the West Bank. I think the move is an attempt by Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, to curtail press freedom. It's happening everywhere. I have more examples to share. A German senior editor dismissed the killing of two journalists in South Lebanon by Israeli fire. He tweeted that the news channel for which the journalists work was a propaganda channel for Hezbollah and had nothing to do with journalism. He also said that the reporters had probably been embedded with the Lebanese terror group attacking northern Israel. I mean, he was trying to justify their killings. Now, would similar remarks be acceptable uh, if those were Western journalists embedded with the IDF, if they were killed by Hamas fire? It's not just Germany, Canada. Bell Media, which operates various Canadian news networks and websites, including CTV and BNN Bloomberg, it's been exposed by its own journalists who said CTV directed us not to use the word Palestine and that senior editors had told employees that protests calling for a ceasefire should not be reported on. This is Canada, the free world. This paragraph from an article published in Breach Media reads, the journalists who are not being identified for fear of retribution described a widespread bias against Palestinians 
that's resulted in a one-sided, incomplete coverage of the violence in Gaza that does a huge disservice to Canadians. The breach also found coverage on CTV national news featured far more Israeli voices than Palestinian voices. War should not be treated like a soccer match with journalists supporting one side, but not the other. Journalists everywhere should stand against oppression, against injustice. They can indeed be biased in favor of the victim, not the aggressor. And that is why it's not okay to condone the October 7th attacks. But it's also not okay to support the killing of civilians, especially children. Another German journalist slammed the UN Secretary General, calling on him to resign after Mr. Guterres said, we are witnessing the killing of civilians on an unprecedented scale. With more than 20,000 civilians killed, that was a very valid and accurate statement to make. Now, journalists have a choice. Either bow under pressure, go with the flow and succumb to censorship, a practice that many Western journalists have themselves criticized in countries like my own, in Arab autocracies, in China, in Turkey and elsewhere, where there's no freedom of expression. Or we choose light, and that would mean sticking to facts, verifying the information we get, regardless of our own biases. Let's not kill objectivity, because that would surely mean the end of the profession itself, with very dangerous implications for the whole of society. I expect that some Western journalists uh, listening to me now would ask, why is this Arab woman lecturing us on journalistic ethics? Why listen to her? She's always worked in a restrictive environment. Why would she know better? Well, they're right, of course, but I learned my lessons the hard way. It's precisely because I live in a restrictive environment where there's no or very little freedom of speech, no freedom of expression, that I value freedom of expression. I know propaganda and bias when I see it. I've always rebelled against it. I quit my job at State TV because the news channel I worked for wasn't covering the protests in Tahrir Square. That was back in 2011, and I thought it would be the end of my broadcasting career. It was a small sacrifice to make. I resigned because I had looked up to Western ideals of free speech, justice, equality for all. We cannot be free unless we do away with our biases, no matter what the cost. And I'm asking my colleagues around the world to uphold those ethics simply because a new generation of young, aspiring journalists admire and respect you for your credibility and experience. They are very eager to learn from you. Let's also do it for the more than 60 journalists that were killed in Gaza in the line of duty. Let's do it for Shireen Abu Akla, for Jamal Khashoggi, for Giulio and Gita Parado, for Daphne Galicia, and many, many more. I also, if you would allow me, Shukda, I, I also have a message for the politicians, should they care to listen. Being racist may win you votes at the ballot box, but it will strip you of your humanity and your credibility. 
outrage is growing around the world, practically everywhere. We've seen the massive protests in all capitals. There's a growing divide between people and governments. Now, Arab sent anti-Arab sentiment and Islamophobia need to be addressed seriously, just as anti-Semitism needs to be addressed. This is our duty as journalists. Manipulation and warmongering isn't our duty. We need to advocate for peace, not war. When a Republican lawmaker from Florida said she wanted all Palestinians dead in response to a question by the Democratic Florida state representative who had asked how many more Palestinians will be enough. Her shocking response was the result of decades of dehumanization of Palestinians, not just by advocates and Israel's apartheid, but also by their enablers, including the media. The dangerous genocidal calls, this level of hatred is indeed at times fueled by the media's vilification of the Arabs and Muslims. This needs to stop. Yes, media bias was also clear with the release of the hostages just a few days ago and yesterday. Uh, they were exchanged you know, for Palestinian detainees in Israeli prisons. Now, the Israeli hostages received extensive media coverage, while there was far less coverage of the released Palestinian detainees. In Israeli media, all Palestinians released from Israeli jails were labeled terrorists. Although some of them are minors, some others were never convicted or were tried in military courts. The Western media told stories of the freed Israeli hostages, humanizing them. We know their names, their age, and their life story. But the released Palestinian detainees were again dehumanized. They were merely referred to as being male or female. We did see some exceptions, though. And I have to commend CNN's Nima al who did a great job of telling both sides of the story. She's an exemplary model, a light amid the darkness. Now, the role of the media is to educate, to inform, and hold people and governments to account. When Christian Amanpour interviewed former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, he said Israel had built the tunnels under Al-Shifa Hospital. And yet Israel and some media insisted that those tunnels were being used by Hamas as a command post. This is the importance of a free and fair media, a media that seeks facts and only facts and reports them after verifying them, helping the public distinguish between truth and lies. I will end this by saying, there can be no lasting peace in our region, the Middle East, without justice, without freedom, but most importantly, without a free media. We need to free our region and the world from pressure groups, from special interest groups, from lobbyists, and from the biased media everywhere. And this includes in my own country, Egypt. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. I, um, I really agree with the points that you have made because this kind of reality is specifically in the censorship of media quite prevalent here too. And um, the kind of silencing of voices for the Palestinian cause or even um, 
the discourse that has been created is state versus terrorism and not the humanitarian angle of it. And that is something which is very troubling. At the same time, the entire uh, military, industrial, governmental nexus that has developed all over the world, media becoming just a scapegoat of it. There are two things which I believe are happening right now. The first is that most of the reporters and a lot of embedded journalism again has started with CNN and all of them being embedded uh, through IDF and then reporting. But uh, one of the problems of journalism has always been a certain kind of parachute journalism that <laughs> the reporters or journalists who do not know the language have no idea about the history, culture, about the social systems, uh, are asked to report about a conflict where they do not have time to go into the historical discourse to even build an opinion for themselves. So they are at the complete um, uh, propaganda of whoever is funding them and what their ideology is. That is one thing which I believe is happening. And the second thing is that equating every Palestinian voice with Islamophobia, which has, uh, because religion is the most sensitive issue, and mixing this with journalism has created a much worse nexus right now and making it very difficult. Like when I went to West Bank, what they do with the Indian passports is that uh, they give you numbers out of one to four. So four, if it is given on your passport by Israel, it means that you are not a threat. You have not done anything or written anything against them or whatever. Three is that but you might have spoken some time or tweeted some time or done. If it is two and one, you'll be immediately deported. Immediately. And the worst thing which I saw, which was something which I just don't understand that how is it possible, is when we went through Jordan to um, the Israeli border to go to Jericho in West Bank, with us, with our group, we had, uh, uh, you know, a couple of like two Australians, one Canadian, one British, who were grandchildren of Palestinian heritage uh, diaspora. Mm -hmm. They were logged in white rooms at the border. They were just logged in the white rooms and for seven hours. Uh -huh. There was no torture on the body, no evidence of assault, nothing. Nothing. They were not humiliated. Nothing. Just logged in for seven hours. And we were there waiting for them for seven hours at the same border. And uh, we just didn't know what's happening. And the only crime was that their grandparents or great-grandparents were Palestinians. And they were trying to visit West Bank for the first time. In fact, there was a UK-based uh, artist who bought his entire camera, a DSLR, to take pictures. While returning, everything was taken away from him. And this kind of brutality, like being a Hindu, uh, because of our team, I was allowed to get into Al-Aqsa Mosque because they ask you to chant something from the Quran. So we had help. So we were able to go. But there were so many Palestinians for whom it was the most religious place. And they have it's never. It's a holy site. Yeah. It's a holy site for Muslims around the world. Yeah, and they have never been to Alexa. And it was something which was very horrific, specifically the uh, sensitivity which I saw in Hebron. And how, you know, because the Ibrahimi mosque, half of it is a mosque and the other is a synagogue. So uh, the kind of backlash that anything can happen anytime. And, you know, Shubda, the problem is a lot of the journalists acted as if this all happened on October 7th. Yeah. You know, the Hamas attacks were horrific. Um, you know, they were brutal. They were vicious. But 
This happens on a daily basis in the occupied Palestinian territories. Harassment, uh, jailing of children, killing, extrajudicial killings. I mean, who can forget the images of Mohammed Durra, who was waving to the soldiers to stop shooting at his son? Uh, and I, I really think that, of course, this didn't start today, but I really think that the April raids by Israeli police and security forces on Al-Aqsa Mosque were the trigger for, for this uh, particular, those atrocious attacks on the 7th of October. So violence only breeds violence. And, you know, there has to be an end to this vicious never-ending cycle.